Following my review of 2020's X Factor number one, I saw a fair amount of commentary from listeners and readers wondering why there's all this focus on character sexuality in the book, specifically with queer X Men. Hot on the heels of Marauders number 12 and Kate Pride's same sex kiss, the question is, of course, resurfacing, making it a good time to really dig into the relevance and importance of sexuality in the world of Marvel's X Men. Up front, I'll admit this is a sensitive issue and I don't pretend to have all the answers. This is my own attempt to wrestle with these recurring questions and dissect them in the context of X-Men comics. While I think it'd be nice, I don't anticipate this conversation will change hearts and minds regarding perceptions of sexuality and gender in our world, but I do hope it will specifically address how these issues are integrated into Marvel's X-Men comics, and why, at the end of the day, it makes sense and is a substantial net positive. Hey, I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of Comic Book Herald. You are listening to Crack and Krakoa number 86. If you like the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel or podcast, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing some spoilers for Discuss Comics, including some of the Dawn of X, will follow. So the question here is why all this focus on sexual identity? First, it's useful to clarify what readers mean by all this focus on sex. Notable examples from the Dawn of X, the era of X-Men comics following writer Jonathan Hickman's return to Marvel with House of X and Powers of Ten include the following. First, the implication that Jean Grey, Wolverine, Cyclops may be in a polyamorous relationship, and the confirmation in the pages of X-Force that Jean and Wolverine are definitely in a relationship together. We also have the reiteration that Mystique and Destiny's same-sex relationship is canon, only recently made official in the pages of History of the Marvel Universe, with Mystique angrily yelling at Professor X and Magneto, give me, I want my wife back, okay? Third, we have a major queer cast of mutants in the Leia Williams-written X-Factor series launch. It is a clear focus of the book to include really as many queer characters on this roster as possible, which has been a tip in Marvel Comics. And finally, we have Emma Frost including trans among the oppressed minorities she references in Marauders number 10, and Kate Pride, as we let off with, kissing her female tattoo artist in Marauders number 12. As you can likely gauge from the examples here, the conversation is less around the general horniness of the X-Men on their Krakoan Island paradise, although certainly that gets a lot of discussion as well, and more targeted toward queer or minority identity now being included in the pages of of these comic books. The fact of the matter is that members of the LGBTQIA community in particular have been long withheld from X-Men comics and Marvel comics. Historical reasons to avoid making queer relationships explicit are due to societal pressure and for Marvel comics specifically due to editorial pressure. According to an article on Prism Comics during Jim Shooter's late 70s in the 1987 tenure as Marvel's editor-in-chief, there was an alleged no gaze in the Marvel Universe policy. This can partially be assumed to reflect the desire to follow the Comics Code Authority, shown here, the Red Scare McCarthyist propaganda directive that arose out of Frederick Wortham's seduction of the innocent way back in 1954. According to History.com, it wasn't until 1989 when the code would allow for an openly gay character in Marvel or DC superhero comic books. There are creators who work in characters coded as gay prior. J.M. DeMatty's work with Arnold Roth in the pages of Captain America comes to mind. But Marvel's North Star was the first to come out as openly gay in 1992's Alpha Flight number 106, a momentous declaration that was then largely ignored. For years after the fact, including a standalone North Star miniseries where the fact that he has come out as their first openly gay character is hardly even mentioned. Even after this, equating queerness with sexual perversion persisted, as Marvel has often labeled any books featuring actual queer characters as adult or for mature audiences only. This was the case in 2002 when Marvel announced the Rawhide Kid would come out as gay in a Marvel Max comic. Following this announcement, in a far from perfect appearance on Crossfire in 2002 with host Tucker Carlson, for real, the strongest argument Stan Lee could muster was the following Seinfeldian point. Let me just mention the Marvel Comics, we are entertainers, and we do books for everybody, and the characters in our books represent everybody. In the X-Men, we have characters from all nationalities. We have both sexes. I didn't write this book. I only learned about it yesterday, but I think it's fine. Among us today, there are gay people. We have one gay hero. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm sure there are gay heroes who exist.
Fear of accepting queer characters on the page is historically met with cowardice, to the everlasting failure of Marvel and the industry at large. Even the aforementioned Rawhide Kids coming out party, and I don't want to oversell the importance of that book because it's very bad, was walked back only a few years later. That's very recent history, and it's far from the progressive, uncompromisingly agenda-driven radical Marvel gets painted as by some of the angrier voices in this conversation. The last decade has decidedly improved on this deeply unbalanced past, from the first same-sex wedding in the pages of Astonishing X-Men number 51 in 2012, to the very recent 2020 wedding of Wiccan and Hulkling in Empire Avengers Aftermath, a very fun, good issue. Still, I think it's crucial to acknowledge Marvel's playing catch-up after decades of failure to represent queer communities, and there's still plenty of work to be done. Historically, the X-Men exist as a representation of oppressed minority groups across the board, born to a degree out of the civil rights movement of the 60s, and growing in scope and scale since. The mutant metaphor is flexible, and the perspective you bring from your own life can often shape what you're going to get out of a story. When you feel your own oppression in these stories, that is true for you as a reader. Pretending that's not true just means that's not a part of your perspective. And it's okay to miss things. I miss elements of comics all the time. Listening to other voices, though, can help expand that awareness, right? It can help you understand elements and ideas behind the work that were not there previously for you in your read of the comic book. Again, X-Men is particularly well-suited to metaphorically capture struggles for equality with a group of mutants sworn to protect mankind, even those who fear and hate them. As Sarah Century puts it in a Sci-Fi.com article, this franchise is a rarity in how consistently it is focused on highlighting the fallacy of bigotry as a major obstacle in its characters' lives and portraying all forms of intolerance as deeply wrong. That is what has drawn such a wide audience to X-Men, and it is what makes it stand out for so many readers. Outsiders have always flocked to this concept and for very obvious reason. It definitely stands out. It's a core part of the X-Men's central thesis. They are protecting the world that fears and hates them, even even be, even with that, okay? One of the clearest examples of the X-Men standing in for real-world minorities comes in 1982's Marvel original graphic novel number 5, God Loves, Man Kills, by Chris Claremont and Brent Anderson. In God Loves, Man Kills, Christian evangelical preacher William Stryker launches a massive religious movement centered around his absolute hatred of mutants. The combination of religion-fueled intolerance and a congregation full of protesting humans with signs like Go Home Beauty makes for a distinct, all-too-familiar connection to real-world bigotry. X-Men comics have varied in their approach to tackling these issues since, but the modernization of X-Men as a metaphor for a oppressed minority is firmly cemented in the Marvel canon. And to be clear, this predates God Loves, Man Kills, okay? You can look back at the Stan and Jack era of Silver Age X-Men and find these ideals, although not cemented perhaps as clearly or as consistently. In recent years, the mutant metaphor has more deliberately extended to LGBTQIA communities. One of the most frequent talking points lately is how modern depictions of known characters' sexuality may differ or seemingly run counter to their comics history. We saw this a lot with Iceman over the past five years, when writer Brian Michael Bendis revealed, in classic comics fashion through time travel and mind reading, that Bobby Drake has been suppressing his gay sexuality. A thing that gets lost in a Marvel character coming out as queer later in their life is the idea that unless they were out and proud in the shared history of these properties prior to this point, the new direction simply doesn't match up. But even in reality, this is simply untrue. When discussing Iceman's sexuality, writer Anthony Ramuglia says, That rings true for a deeply suppressed gay man. A person suppressing their sexual sexuality that intensely would appear to everyone else like an average straight person because that's the role they've convincing themselves they occupy. They aren't just trying to fool everyone around them, they're trying to fool themselves. And I think if we look around to circumstances and perspectives, we can sort of, you know, imagine and definitely perceive that this is reality for people in, the, in our, our world. It's not the same thing, but I'd also note that as comics fans, we're accustomed to big, bold new changes that present the possibility for new stories. We accept these things in readers constantly. They are what keep a decades-running universe occasionally fresh. Just look at Moira X. Prior to Hickman's X-Men, Moira McTaggart was a human ally to mutant kind and one-time love interest of Charles Xavier. Now, she's a mutant, replaying lifelines and the single most compelling concept in superhero comics, at least if you ask me. There's a conservative type of reader who rejects these changes in favor of, you know, a, a staying true to the good old days. But for me, these are the ideas and new angles I live for. These are why superhero comics remain exciting. 
With Iceman, I'd argue the character as a gay man works best when understanding him as a closeted individual trying to pass, rather than retroactively arguing these were the intentions of the creators. Because for all their positive contributions to social justice, Stanley and Jack Kirby, I don't believe, created Bobby Drake with the intention to show he was gay. If you're interested more in retroactively examining the character's history for clues that are there, I'd recommend the Out Cold series of essays on ShelfDust.com, which I will include in the among the many, many sources that I have gathered while I've been digging into this topic and, and really exploring sexuality in X-Men comics. In the more recent example of Cape Pride in the Dawn of X, there's a long history of bisexual subtext that is unquestionably part of the creator's intent. From an interview with Chris Claremont on Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men, with Kitty, the basic idea was while she dated lots of people when she was an adolescent, the primal love of her life has always been Rachel. That's actually part of the creator's intent he never quite made explicit. I don't think this is Claremont retroactively trying to pull a J.K. Rowling either. Again, from Sarah Sentry on Sci-Fi.com. Well into the 80s, more and more queer subtext was played out on the pages. Ileana Rasputin and Kitty Pride wrestling with each other in bed. Storm and Yukio's fling. Mystique and Destiny appearing only in tangent to one another. North Star's lack of interest in women. Rachel Summers in her entirety. There was a lot of implied queerness in Claremont's X-Men run. The young Kitty Pride joins the X-Men as a young teenager in Uncanny X-Men number 129, a comic with the release date of January 1980 and a story that kickstarts the official Dark Phoenix saga. Kitty would go on to become a central POV character in the X-Men's Claremont verse, bridging the gaps between X-Men, New Mutants, and Excalibur more than any other character in the X-Men world. Kitty's journey, again starting as a 14-year-old mutant coming to terms with her powers, is very much about finding her place and understanding the Jewish mutant woman she is becoming over time, right? We see Kitty's development more so than we see practically anyone in X-Men because we start with her right at the beginning, right as she's coming in to her mutant abilities. This extends to her sexuality as well, as it does for so many in their formative adolescent years. The most prominent and permitted example is Kitty's flirtation with Peter Rasputin, Colossus, a character she's had romantic ties to as recently as 2018's fake-out wedding issue in X-Men Gold. At the same time, there are recurring examples of Kitty's closest female friends suggesting deeper connections bordering on romantic. These examples can be found in Claremont written issues from the mid-80s into the 90s and all the way through to 2002's all-but-forgotten mechanics miniseries. Most famously, in order of chronology, we have the following. Kitty Pride and Ileana Rasputin. There's an undeniable bond between Kitty and Ileana, who become fast, extremely close friends at the Xavier Institute. From Kitty's literal, generally unexplained bond to Ileana's soul that causes her to take on Ileana's soul sword when the New Mutants are seemingly killed in New Mutants number 36, to their now infamous tickle fight alone in their bedrooms in New Mutants number 63, Kitty and Ileana are a consistent subtext subtextual reference and one still very much in play today. Kitty Pride and Rachel Summers. Kitty and Rachel are very close throughout the entirety of Excalibur, and while of course the characters can just be friends, there are enough moments in these comics to suggest there's more to it. As already mentioned, Claremont has since declared Rachel the love of Kitty's life, and there are loads of moments spent together in this title that justify the reading. We see a similar closeness, as Rachel senses Kitty in danger in the pages of Uncanny X-Men. This happens over and over again, right, as she bursts onto the scene willing to do anything to protect her Kitty. We learned over the course of a handful of issues exploring the Days of Future Past timeline that this attachment is part of Rachel's beginnings in the future, with the older Kate we meet in those classic Uncanny X-Men number 141 to number 142. We also have Kitty Pride and Courtney Ross, who goes on to be revealed as the sort of villainous Saturnine, but this is one of the absolute most deliberate examples that occurs in the pages of Excalibur when Brian Braddock's love interest, Courtney Ross, makes clear seductive overtures to Kitty. In his own online forum, longtime Excalibur artist and Chris Claremont collaborator Alan Davis said of Kitty and Courtney and of these scenes, although I knew Chris had some plan for Saturnine to corrupt Kitty and that the various cross-time versions of Saturnine were attracted to Kitty, I had no idea what, if any, the goal of this relationship was to be. I just played it as a lesbian affair. You can criticize the intent or execution, but there's no denying this was meant to yet again show Kitty as interested. And then we have Kitty Pride and Karma. The Extreme X-Men mini, Mechanics, is a general footnote in the canon of Chris Claremont, but it focuses wholly on Kitty trying to find herself in college after the death of her father in the new X-Men destruction of Genosha. During this time, Kitty reconnects with longtime new mutant Zan Koi Man, aka Karma, an out lesbian. The two share several tender touches, conversations, and glances as they grow increasingly close over the course of this series. Now, Karma, again, has come out as an out lesbian in the pages of New Mutant Sense this time, and the general you know, relationship has been, has been mostly ignored, but again, all these things, they did happen. 
It's all very much there, even if culturally Marvel refused to admit it. In her excellent essay, Kitty Queer, Sigrid Ellis writes, Egodystonic homosexuality was removed from the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in 1986. New Mutants number 36 was published in February 1986. When it was written, lesbianism was legally and medically a perversion. Chris Claremont and Bill Sienkiewicz, the writer and artist of New Mutants at the time, could not say that Ileana came to the rescue of her sometime girlfriend, Kitty, who had been defeated by a demon with a penchant for classic bondage porn. But they could write it and draw it without ever acknowledging that that is what they were doing. So why the focus on these characters' sexualities? Well, it's an effort to represent a minority group that historically has been unjustly withheld from the X-Men universe and resigned to coded hints by creators so inclined to sneak them into the book. An enormous part of X-Men fandom is deeply engaged with the soap operatic structure and the romantic entanglements of these characters that we become so attached to. The part that's easy to take for granted is that historically, most of these plot lines, for example, Rogue and Gambit in a cyclical will they, won't they, are standard heteronormative relationships. In the gazillion variations on Rogue and Gambit's romance, I've never seen anyone ask, why does their sexuality matter? It's taken for granted that this is quote-unquote normal and simply how stories are done. Why should that not extend to queer characters? Why should that be withheld from them? This absence is damaging to the X-Men's central thesis of creating a fair world for the oppressed and the different. As Grimuglia writes, the lack of queer parallels leads to two negative results. It lessens the relevance of the X-Men's metaphor, and it weakens the discussion of oppression in the real world. Both of these problems keep the X-Men saga from resonating with its queer audience, which is increasingly confronted with bigotry in the form of harassment, hate crimes, and governmental oppression. All of this, of course, now reflected in the real world, right? It's a disservice to, I think, X-Men readership, and again, to kind of the tenets of the book, kind of what it stands for and what it's meant to stand for. I do also want to address the recurring suggestion that it's not the sexuality that's the problem, so much as the focus on the, and again, I quote, woke agenda over a good story. This focus on reducing all thought to make good story is woefully inadequate criticism. On Comic Book Herald, I rank and evaluate thousands upon thousands of comics. I make no bones that clearly my definition of good is going to lead to plenty of readers who disagree with me. I talk about this a lot on the My Marvelous Year podcast, but in the first few years of running the reading clubs, there are a billion examples of people telling me, hey, this story you love, it stinks, or it didn't work for me at all. And nobody should be shocked or surprised about this. Now, certainly there can be critical consensus or even popular consensus around a work's quality, but let's not sit here and pretend this is easily and universally defined. Your definition of good is probably not mine, is probably not your neighbor's, is not your family's, and on down the line. We all recognize this, and yet there are all these caveman cries for make good story. The fact that it doesn't work for you alone does not make it a bad story. There's an implication in loudly decrying stories inclusive of queer sexuality that this is all Marvel publishes now. The absolute irony of this is as Marvel slowly works to make up for decades of completely absent representation, they are called out for too much sudden representation. For the most vocal critics, the only acceptable solution would be if Marvel attempted to catch up at a rate so glacially slow that they never really came close to making up for the lost time at all. Given the historical context, the desire to see Marvel tell stories like they used to is a desire to see Marvel never broach these topics at all. The attempt to paint modern efforts of representation as sudden and forced is really just an excuse to say you prefer the absence of queer characters in Marvel's history. And that history is simply not equitable, not by a long shot. When a great many of the comics you don't like have a perceived agenda of diversity, it's worth examining those common threads and really considering whether you're open to new perspectives. Why do these editions stand out so much as a reader? As an example, Leia Williams, David Baldion, and the creative team's X Factor No. 1 is a highly engaging first issue, exploring aspects of life on Krakoa, the Five, Resurrection Protocols, and several characters we haven't seen much of in the Dawn of X. You can talk about this issue extensively, and I did in my review, without focusing extensively on the queer relationships. It's a facet of the fabric, and for all the reasons I've outlined, a force for good. But it's only one piece of a multifaceted story. Criticisms that the comic is lost to a social justice agenda are deliberately obsessing over fictional character sexuality in a way the story isn't even doing. 
Not to mention, if I look across the Dawn of X, there are plenty of titles that aren't really digging into queer relationships at all, and have widely varying tones and concepts that might appeal to different audiences. X-Men mostly, X-Force, Hellions, Giant Size X-Men, Cable, X-Men Fantastic Four, Wolverine, Fallen Angels, New Mutants, it's a vast majority of the line. When the comic does make mention of character's sexual identity, it's to showcase the variance and variety of queer individuals in the world, to showcase different personalities and different interests to avoid singular stereotypes across communities. Dakan is super different than Prodigy, and yes, they're both bisexual. This is a deeper level of representation and a logical progression from the simplicity of Stan Lee's earlier implication that Marvel's one gay hero was a real nice, tacitly acceptable effort to hit a quota. This comes closer to actual accurate, accurate representation in that regardless of shared traits in a community, individual people are still terrifically unique when you actually spend the time to get to know them. At the end of the day, explicitly putting queer characters on the page is enormously important. Representation matters tremendously. It can't just be left to the background, it can't be subtext, and pretending that's enough. It's not enough. It matters for people in the minority who are now reflected. It matters for other minority groups who are not reflected that can now one day see themselves reflected, and it matters for non-minority readers who are otherwise less familiar or exposed to the existence of these groups. It matters. It's a way of saying this exists. This is real, and it exists in our world too. In other words, you are real. You matter, and you exist. All of you. I'm Dave. You can find my stuff over at comicbookherald.com. Support for Comic Book Herald is by patreon.com slash comicbookherald. I'd like to give a shout here to the mysterious benefactors tier, all the individuals who are backing Comic Book Herald at the highest level. Thank you very much for all of your support in Comic Book Herald initiatives, as well as Kraken Krakoa. Again, you can find more of my work, including the full essay here with some expanded commentary on comicbookherald.com. You can find links to sources in the show notes, and you can also look for the best comics ever in my Marvelous Year podcast for more from me. Again, if you like the show and the YouTube channel, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and as always, enjoy the comics.